autism spectrum disorder, depression, and the sensory crisis. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, a psychiatrist, and this video is about mental health education and self-improvement. Today's video topic is based on a viewer question from Rosa, and I'm going to read excerpts of it. Can you make a video about autism, sensory crisis, and depression? I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and depression. I suffer from sensory crisis since I was very little. I struggled with school and social activities. Since I started my treatment for depression, my sensory crisis went down a lot. I still have them, but not as often as I used to. I'm just taking my antidepressants, sertraline, lamotrigine, and clonazepam. My question is, how can the medication cure or reduce my sensory crisis once I'm in remission? Thank you, Rosa, for this question. First, I'll define autism spectrum disorder that I'll call ASD. Then I'll talk about how we address ASD and comorbid illnesses like depression. So first, let me tell you a little bit about autism. How we define autism has changed over the years. It started out as infantile autism in 1980. Then in 1987, it became pervasive developmental disorder. Then in 1994, other subtypes were added like Asperger's syndrome, which was considered a higher functioning level of autism. Then in 2013, we incorporated all these terms into one term, autism spectrum disorder. These changes are based on research that increased our understanding of it. ASD is a developmental disorder, meaning it starts in childhood, but we no longer have a cutoff for when you need to notice the symptoms. If it's very severe, it may be noticeable when you're a baby, but in milder forms, it may not be noticeable until late grade school or early teen years when the demands of socializing exceed your ability to adapt. So here's how we define it. We have two broad categories. You have deficits in social communication and interaction and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Those are the two categories of problems, and here's how they break down. For the social communication and interaction, you have three parts to this, and you must have all three. Deficits in social and emotional reciprocity. This refers to things like being able to have back and forth conversation with someone, or being able to share interests with people, or initiate conversations. The second thing is problems with nonverbal communication that you would use in the social interactions. And examples of this would be things like keeping eye contact with someone when you're talking, or you might have a complete lack of facial expression when you're talking. And the third part of this would be difficulty in maintaining relationships. And this is not just being a bad friend because you're not calling someone back. This would look like having zero interest in people or having a serious problem relating to people in a way that allows you to have a relationship. Another reason for the problem with relationships may be that you can't adjust your behavior to fit a social situation. So this social situation and communication deficit has all three components to it. So I don't want you to think, I don't like people, so does that mean I have ASD? This is a grouping of symptoms that are all happening at the same time. With the restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, you must have two of the four ways that this can look. Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements or speech. This can be things like hand flapping, rocking, repeating things, or repeating the thing, something that someone says. Being extremely inflexible and insisting on things being the same way or being attached to a detailed routine having very restricted but intense interest in certain things. Usually these interests are things that other people might find odd or peculiar, and these interests might make this person very knowledgeable on certain topics, almost like an eccentric professor. And the person not only becomes consumed with these interests, but these interests can interfere socially because you're always bringing it up in conversation. If someone is in your presence, they will know that this is something you're obsessed with. Then there's atypical sensory processing. With this, you can get hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. And some examples of this are becoming anxious around certain sounds or textures, um, ex excessively touching things or smelling things. 
Then there's a further breakdown of this disorder by severity levels, and I won't get on a lot of detail about this, I'll just mention it. Level one is when a person's symptoms and behavior require just a little support. Level two is substantial support, and level three requires very substantial support. So this is autism spectrum disorder. When you combine all of these behaviors, it makes for a very diverse disorder. No two people with ASD look the same. So back to Rosa's question. She asked about how to deal with sensory crisis and depression. There are no specific medications used to treat the core symptoms of ASD, and this would be the problems with communication and repetitive behaviors, including the sensory sensitivity. There's only two medications FDA approved to treat ASD, and these are risperidone and aripiprazole, or Abilify. These medications are what we call neuroleptic medications or antipsychotic medications, and they're only approved to treat the irritability or aggression that can come with ASD, particularly in young children. However, as of the date of this video, the drug Balovaptan is under development by the drug company Hoffman La Roche and is in phase three clinical trials for the treatment of ASD. <laughs> The FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for the drug, which is a way to fast track it to market. This drug would be the first of its kind to treat the social problems and the extreme social anxiety that you get with ASD. Now, I'm not privy to the drug company's timeline to get it to market, but if you're interested in this, keep your eyes open. We do use some medications off-label to treat some of the other issues like the sensory sensitivity. Off-label just means that they're not FDA approved for this purpose, but they've been found in studies to be helpful, so clinicians will use them anyway. Some medications we use for sensory sensitivity are alpha agonists like guanfacine and clonidine, neuroleptics like risperidone, aripiprazole, quetiapine. We also use anticonvulsants like valproate, lamotrigine, and gabapentin. These medications can also be helpful with the other symptoms, such as overactivity, anxiety, aggression, and irritability, as well as the repetitive behavior. If a person with ASD also has a depression, we would use antidepressants, usually the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like sertraline, fluoxetine, and escitalopram, just to name a few. These medications can also help with the obsessional behavior and the anxiety. Rosa specifically asked if the medication would cure her sensory crisis. I don't expect realistically that the sensory crises would be completely resolved. It may greatly reduce your sensitivity like you said it did, but there's usually remains some level of sensitivity to sounds, touch, light, texture, but it's usually more manageable and doesn't have to be to the crisis level. Some people use their sensitivity reactions as a soothing mechanism. For example, suppose you're someone who becomes overwhelmed in a crowd. One way to, to help with that is you can take a break and maybe go stroke a rough object or something to help you calm down. For some people, that helps. With ASD, there's an intolerance to certain types of sensory input, but some sensory input is like receiving a burst of energy that rejuvenates you in a way that it doesn't in a person without ASD. The different types of sensory stimulation that are aggravating versus soothing is gonna be different for the individual. So this is where it becomes important for you to know yourself and know what you need to stay away from and what you need to embrace and use as a coping mechanism. As I mentioned, no one person with ASD is the same, but here are some examples of calming techniques. Using a weighted blanket to sleep under, wearing a compression vest. For some people, the pressure around your trunk can be very soothing. Taking a bath, using noise-canceling headphones if you're sensitive to sounds. There's a company called Stemtastic that sells textured toys that you can use to help soothe and calm you. And they've got things like chewable necklaces or spinner rings, lots of lovely things. One more thing that I want to mention that Rosa didn't specifically ask about, and that is the issue of difficulty recognizing and expressing emotions. And this is actually a term called alexithymia. And alexithymia is an altered emotional awareness. And with it, you're unable to express emotions verbally and have an impoverished imagination. In other words, there's not much to your fantasy life. 
Alexithymia can be found in other neurological disorders like strokes, for example, but there's a lot of overlap between alexithymia and ASD. How you're feeling can contribute to internal distress and low mood. What can help with this is not medication so much as behavior therapies and skills training. And the younger you are when you start with this, the more you get out of it, but it's never too late to work on recognizing your emotions. And I have a download for you to help you with this. It's my set of emotions cards. These cards help you recognize basic emotions that you may be experiencing and look at other emotions that are related to it. For example, sadness is very general and there's different reasons that you can feel sad, but if we could break it down a little further, sadness could be hopelessness, disappointment, gloominess as an example, and there's a big difference between hopelessness and disappointment, but on the surface, they can both look sad. So these cards are designed to increase your emotional vocabulary. So you can take the broader generic emotions and more specifically identify your real emotion. And my hope is that you'll, this will improve your ability to quickly recognize how you're feeling about something. And this exercise can be good for anyone who has trouble recognizing how they feel about something. The cards are free. If you want them, click on the link in the description. It'll take you to my website where you can see how to download them. If you're already a part of my email community though, the cards are waiting for you in your inbox. Share this video with a friend. See you next time.